Hey everyone, we have Matt, the CEO of Block Native here. He'll be doing a talk on block building, what Web3 developers need to know post-merge. And I'll let him take it from here. Thanks everyone. And uh, really excited to be here today. I'm Matt Cutler, I'm founder and CEO of Block Native. We're uh, experts in the pre-chain layer, sort of everything that happens to transactions before they go live on the network. And uh, we're gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, talking about some of the major changes that are happening inside the network uh, at the merge and some of the consequences uh, those have for builders like yourself. Um, and so, hey, we need to know the merge is coming. Obviously, uh, it's coming soon, most likely before the end of the year, They're always a bit of a moving target. If we look at Polymarket, it looks like the consensus at the moment, or at least when we built this slide was sometime between, uh, sometime in October, um, is most likely, but we expect it to be before the end of the year. End of the year, of course. Um, you know, the merge is the most significant uh, upgrade to the network to date. It really is a, a fundamental reinvention of the core of the network. It is worth understanding a bit of the nuances uh, associated with the merge, and then some of the consequences of those nuances are pretty interesting to explore for all participants of the network. Um, I like to say that the merge basically represents a second genesis block. Now, of course, the existing chain state will carry over. That's why it's called the merge. But uh, the network itself will work in such a different way. There'll be so many new classes of actors that uh, it's almost like a completely new game. And so uh, many people will say, oh, if only I'd known about Ethereum earlier, if only I'd been involved in Bitcoin at the beginning. And, and I'm arguing for folks that the right way to think about this is the, the immediately post-merge is like a new Genesis block whole new classes of opportunities will emerge and that everybody needs to start getting ready for that so you can take advantage of it, of course. So uh, what is the merge about and what is sort of at the core of the merge? And I think one of the things that's, that's sort of underappreciated is how the merge uh, preserves decentralization through modularity. Now, the merge itself is a core upgrade to the Ethereum network where we're going to transition from proof of work to proof of stake. I'll talk about a, bu a bunch about that. Um, and the reason for this transition is to sort of set the foundation for future scalability. Um, th at the merge itself, there actually won't be much in terms of additional scalability of the network, but it sort of lays the, the necessary foundation to make that possible in a way that preserves and arguably even enhances decentralization. So uh, I like to say, hey, look, in the 90s, the entire world went from being um, offline to being online. And today we enjoy and live in a, in a largely online reality where right now the whole world is going from being off chain to being on chain. And of course, at the very beginning of that, if you just think about the number of transactions that are occurring in, in, in the world today, the, the vast majority, in fact, just a rounding error of those are on chain today. The vast majority of transactions, whether they be financial or technical or, or otherwise, are occurring off chain. Um, and I think those of us in Web3 very much understand and believe that, that all of that's going to transition into being on-chain. And we're going to live in an on-chain future, just like today we live in an online reality. And in order for us to step into that on-chain future, we need you know, many orders of magnitude, scalability, and throughput of the, the foundations of Web3. And the merge really is all about setting that foundation for Ethereum so that we can step into that on-chain future. Um, uh, this modularity is basically takes the core of the network and turns it into a series of building blocks, a series of Lego bricks that um, each can be innovated upon independently and each has its own decentralization properties. Um, this modularity is occurring at the consensus layer, that's proof of stake. Um, it's, accru it's accru accruing at the execution layer, which we're going to talk about. And as a consequence of this, it's also going to be accruing at the data availability layer, which we'll, we won't talk about today, but it's worth doing some research on. Now, modularity is significant for builders because it enables composability, programmable, programmability, and ultimately expressiveness. It means that these things, which are somewhat monolithic today, which in many regards are somewhat abstract and sort of removed from most network participants suddenly become, um, you know, very, very flexible, fluid, um, and, and you can apply creativity to them. And we're starting to see the beginning of that already, which is pretty cool. So where you have this modularity across these three layers and you inherit these three properties, 
what happens is new opportunities get unlocked. And, and this is super exciting. And, and I think there's a bunch of new economic opportunity that's going to be created. And this is why we view this as a new genesis block. Um, so as we think about this transition from proof of work to proof of stake, we're going away from energy intensive mining, where the proof of work uh, algorithms today, which are very well understood, are secured by computation. And because they're secured by computation, you have to buy computers to do the computation, and then you have to power those computers with energy. And both of those things, the, the computers and the energy are, are purchased and paid for in the real world, quote unquote, off chain and paid in fiat. So you have these negative externalities associated with proof of work, where ultimately, in order to, to, to run and secure the network, you need things which are from outside the network itself that have all sorts of um, issues and constraints and, and, and issue, you know, concerns that don't have anything to do with the network. And one of the things that's generally true of cryptographic systems is the more self-referential they can be, the easier they're to control and the easier they are to evolve. And so um, anyways, it's that's not great that proof of work has these negative externalities. Um, now, why does someone participate, uh, devote hash power, devote compute power, expend energy to be a part of a proof of work network is they have economic incentives to do so. You have block rewards. So if you win a block, you get new issuance as a result of that. Um, you can collect the priority fee in the case of Ethereum, the gas fees. And then also sort of a new emergent property is this idea of MEV or um, maximal extractable value. It was originally called minor extractable value. It's now been more um, uh, generalized to be maximal or maximum extractable value. Um, MEV is the value derived from transaction ordering. And, and here's the thing I always emphasize is MEV is a natural consequence of all transaction systems, um, of all ordered transaction systems, which are, by the way, all transaction systems, because you can't have a transaction system without order. Um, and MEV exists in, in all markets today, like the stock market. You have uh, uh, large uh, HFT traders who pay for order flow. And as a result of that order flow, they make micro manipulations of, of uh, order routing and of pricing in order to, to extract value from that. What's different about Web3 is MEV is now exposed that because these blockchain systems are open source with transparent data, you can actually see it happening. And so MEV has really come to the forefront in many regards uh, because it's such an interesting effect, because there's a lot of economic value that gets generated, and it's much more transparent or has the opportunity to be much more transparent in Web3 than in other systems. Uh, a little aside here, MEV exists in search. Everybody knows this, like, hey, if you do a Google search, you want to be on the first page rather than the 10th page. Why? Because you're going to get a lot more clicks, which are valuable on the first page versus the 10th page. That's getting value from ordering, right? Hey, if you're on the first page, you get more clicks if you're in slot one than if you're slot two, right? And there's all sorts of uh, things that you do in order to ensure that your SEO, your uh, 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 content related to that term uh, is, is placed as high as possible. Nobody has any questions about this. Nobody questions it. Nobody worries about this. This is just something you do in order to have uh, uh, to rank and get traffic on Google search, for instance. And, and MEV in many regards is similar to that. But of course, it has economic value. And so the idea about MEV is you're specifically uh, manipulating, uh, ordering within a block in order to extract value. And so this is a diagram um, from a research piece. You can see the source here, where on the left you have the mempool and you just say, up oh, these two transactions have the highest tip. So they're gonna go higher in the block and you're gonna uh, rank order uh, the transactions in the block based by gas price. Whereas uh, with MEV, you have uh, intentional um, uh, manipulation of the ordering in order to, to put certain transactions in a certain sequence. And as a result of that value can be recognized. Um, uh, uh, proof of stake, as we talk about this, uh, is moving towards, uh, is, we're moving towards proof of stake as part of the merge. It's secured by economic incentives with ETH as the native asset of the network, driving those economic incentives and therefore reducing externalities. And so you don't have proof of work, doesn't require special computation, doesn't require lots of power, it requires minimal power. And the idea is that the network can be secured by the core native asset itself and by regular people running regular consumer grade hardware. They don't need any specialized infrastructure, need special network connections. They don't need giant amounts of, um, of storage for instance, and in massive amounts of compute. And that basically uh, ensures decentralization of the security layer of the network. Now, 
uh, as part of proof of stake, the economic incentives change. So the block rewards go down substantially because you don't need the block rewards to pay for the power that you needed under proof of work. Okay. So block rewards come down a lot. Gas fees aren't going to be changed very much, at least at the outset. And if in general, the trajectory of gas fees is is to bring them down. So therefore, the economic incentives for participation begin to erode under proof of stake. It's easier to participate. There's not as much incentive to do so. And that puts interesting pressure on MEV. And so of the three sources of economic incentive for network security, MEV begins to come to the fore as a much more important and potentially a much more critical aspect of how the network operates. Um, which brings a, a new form of modularity to the network, which is known as proposer builder separation. It's quite a fascinating topic. It's a rapidly emerging topic. If it's something you're interested in, I very much do encourage you to do some Google searching because there's quite a lot being written about it. There's quite a lot unfolding in real time and it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, under the prior proof of, or the current proof of work setup, um, there's this notion of building blocks. And that's like, who are the actors in the network who decides which transactions are going to be in which block in what order. And today, mining pool operators are the ones who build the blocks. And if you look at the way the, the current Ethereum proof of work network operates, a very small number of mining pools, like maybe four or five, control the vast majority of hash power. So you have basically four or five entities that are not particularly well understood, not particularly transparent, are, are basically the ones determining what goes into a block. And uh, that is probably not great for the long-term health of the network. And, and what proposer builder uh, separation does is introduce modularity and decentralization to this critical act of building blocks. So you have contents of the mempool. You say, hey, look, we're going to construct a block with transactions in a certain sequence. Um, what proposer builder separation does is it abstracts out this idea of who builds the block from the entity which is proposing and validating the block. So, hey, in proof of stake, you're going to have validators. Validators stake ETH in order to secure the network. And from time to time, uh, a validator is selected to be part of a committee. So they get sort of special privileges. Within that committee, they get they, they are selected. An individual validator is selected as a block proposer. This is your sort of head of the chain. And you as the validator get to determine what the next block will include. That's a position of privilege, it's a position of power, and is also uh, could be a source of centralization. And so what proposer builder separation does is break apart the act of being the head of the chain from the act of actually deciding which transactions are gonna be in the block in which sequence. Um, so under proof of stake, block builders, a new economic actor will build most blocks, not necessarily all blocks. We anticipate at least 75% participation among validators at the outset with economic incentives built into this to, try to drive block builder participation uh, closer to 100%, but it'll be interesting to see how this happens uh, immediately after the merge. So what's going to happen at the merge is a new class of network participant will, will be active on the network called the block builder. And what block builders do and, and, and why PBS matters is it um, basically helps reduce the compute requirements for a validator to participate. So literally it becomes trivially, trivially easier, easy for anyone to operate their own validator. Um, it counteracts some of the natural forces of validator centralization driven by MEV. It also helps the network extract MEV more efficiently. And um, it incentivizes these resource intensive infrastructure providers because the act of block building is anticipated to be a fairly complex computational task, fairly complex data storage requirements, uh, fa fairly complex network infrastructure requirements, is it incentivizes these actors who have those capabilities to devote those resources to the network network and it drives execution layer modularity and there's a whole bunch of interesting properties that emerge from that. So this is a quick diagram of, of what this will look like 
at the merge. So there is what's known as in-protocol PBS, which will be a uh, part of a future upgrade of the network, most likely probably a year after, a year plus after the merge. But immediately at the merge, there's a off-chain mechanism to enable PBS called MEV Boost, which has been championed by the team at Flashbots. This is a, a Flashbots diagram. And basically what it, it does is it allows multiple block builders, you can see them in the lower left-hand corner, to build and propose blocks and to transmit those for consideration via a piece of infrastructure called MEV Boost. And what MEV, Bo MEV Boost does is of all the builders um, and through some relays, they multiple blocks uh, templates get submitted and MEV Boost does the logic of selecting which is the best block to promote. And what the validator, the proposer does is just say, rather than build their own block, they just say, MEV Boost, give me the, the best block. And MEV Boost passes that through. And so you have block builders who are one set of actors and proposers, validators who are a different set of actors. And there's communication occurring between them via MEV Boost. Okay. And how this happens is actually a real-time auction where block builders compete with each other to get the to win the block um, from a block template perspective. And to do so, they actually put economic value associated with it. So ultimately, block builders pay uh, proposers to use their block. And those who pay the most, maybe or maybe not, will win the block. And, and that will become the truth and be proposed to the rest of the network and, and go out and become part of the chain. So... There's this interesting question about, will all PBS blocks maximize MEV? Is that the entire game here? And not necessarily, because proposer builder separation enables composability, programmability, and expressiveness at this layer. Some or many PBS blocks will maximize MEV and therefore have maximum value. But you could say, well, some MEV is, is not great. It, it, it uh, creates uh, less favorable settlement conditions for network participants. So maybe validators will say, hey, I, I want a different type of block construction, which includes benevolent only MEV. So yes, you can include MEV, but only stuff that doesn't adversely impact user transactions. Or maybe gas price ordered, the, the naive traditional way, or time ordered, or future auctions, or censorship enabled, which would be negative as well, and many more. So one of the interesting consequences of PBS is it will enable new levels of expressivity of block construction types and create sort of choices in the marketplace. And we think that's pretty constructive for the network. And there's lots of interesting things that can happen here. Um, now, because of this, uh, they'll be have different sort of economic actors with different motivations, creates new pathways for value to flow. And this is something really critical. Today, under proof of work, all the value flows to the miners because they have the privileged position. That's not necessarily going to be the case or does it need to be the case after the merge under proof of stake. Um, so how does this happen, right? Hey, MEV is the more fundamental economic driver for network participation and therefore network security. Um, so what's the source of MEV? Where does MEV actually originate from? It originates from transactions and of course, end user transactions. So what if that economic value could flow back to the source? Um, and so whoever is closer to the source of origin may be in more posi position to receive more value, which doesn't work that way today, which we think creates all sorts of new opportunities and new power structures for sources of transaction origin. Users, wallet, dApps, protocols, exchanges, marketplaces, any place where users go in order to get transactions on chain now has an opportunity potentially to participate in new ways at the core of the network. And so we encourage all of those actors to begin preparing for the merge now and to do so by integrating real-time mempool data to facilitate transaction composition, that the more active you can be in facilitating transaction composition, the better position you, you are to say, hey, we helped this transaction happen, therefore we should participate in the value flow which is made possible under PBS. And so this new reality is dawning and dawning quickly, and we think that's pretty cool. We think there's a bunch of work for um, uh, wallets, dApps, uh, 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 protocols, marketplaces, and exchanges to, to start doing in order to get prepared for this. Um, things that you can do to help with transaction composition include gas estimation, transaction preview, being aware when MEV is involved in general transaction monitoring. And of course, I share a lot of this stuff because we at Block Native provide 
the easy button for this stuff. We have real-time infrastructure that does all of these things. Uh, we have real-time gas APIs that provide a best-in-class understanding of what's going to be in the next block and therefore very accurately predicts what gas fees are going to be and how to structure your transactions. We make that available via our industry-leading gas estimator, which you can install uh, via a gas uh, plugin uh, right into your browser. And you can even get real-time alerts when gas uh, prices fall above or below certain thresholds. Uh, we provide you know, global transaction simulation infrastructure that can be used for previewing transactions so you can get inside of them overall. And we have sort of best in class tooling for monitoring the mempool and providing uh, transaction, uh, pre, uh, transaction insight as they're flowing through. This is what's known as mempool explorer and, and just really makes all this stuff super easy for builders and traders alike to, to get after this stuff so that you can incorporate these capabilities into what you're building and be ready post uh, merge. And that was exactly 20 minutes on block building what Web3 developers need to know post merge. Thanks so much for having me today. And you can find me on Twitter at mcutler. You can find Block Native at blocknative.com and appreciate everybody's time. Thanks, Matt. This was great. We're going to transition to the next session now. Thanks again.